Hi guys, welcome to a very special episode of Darkness and Light. In this episode I'm going to be dealing with the Divine Feminine. Before we get into this episode, just a few things I want to let you know. This is going to be very information heavy. So it might be something you want to come back to, it might be something you want to start and stop or pause. Or you might want to have your iPads and your phone out because I need you to do your own research. I don't have the time to go into high level detail of everything. Maybe one day I'll do a live teaching session where we can go into high level detail, but I'm trying to actually keep it just high level on this episode and just dealing with certain topics and taking you through the foundation and the understanding of what I mean by the manifestation of the divine feminine. Also, this uh, is for believers. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're not trying to be saved, this is not for you. And I know some of you are triggered by this title, but it's okay. Jezebel must die. Also, another thing I want to deal with before we get into this episode. It really does behoove us as Christians in 2018, in this last day and age where we know knowledge has increased, to research, to understand what we are facing to understand the world that we are in. Some of us are jumping onto movements and social justice agendas that we don't understand. If you look on the uh, website of the Black Lives Matter movement, they're anti-family. They're pro-LGBTQ. The feminism movement is anti-family. It's anti-gender roles. Now, the Bible has set up gender-specific roles. So you cannot be saying that you're a Christian and a feminist. You need to research the movement. You need to research its origins. And you need to understand the spirit behind it. I touch on feminism in this episode. But in episode 2, and part 2 of this, I'll be going into it deeper. But as we get into this now, take some time out. Make sure you've got a good hour ahead of you to watch this video, to pause it, to do some research and to really take some time to understand exactly what I'm trying to tell you and you can see the agendas of the enemy. God bless you. manifestation of the divine feminine. I believe that the divine feminine spirit is a principality spirit. Now the word principalities is taken from the word that is Greek known as archai. It's an old word that is used symbolically to denote ancient times. It is also used to depict individuals who hold the highest and loftiest position of rank and authority. By using the word archai, Paul emphatically tells us that at the very top of Satan's kingdom are powerful evil beings that have held their lofty positions of power and authority since ancient times, probably ever since the fall of Lucifer. So I've ranked here, as you can see, uh, the satanic order. I've mentioned many times that Satan is a copycat. He has an exact copy of what God has. So God has the kingdom of light. He has the kingdom of darkness. And he also has his angels arranged in the same way God would have them arranged. And as we can see, Lucifer is at the top of the pyramid here. But beneath him are the principalities. And I believe that the divine feminine, along with other spirits, form the same pantheon of pagan gods that were first articulated in Babylon. So just to lay the ground, set the foundation, Babylon is the home of all religion. It is the birthplace of the triad or triunity of gods. Uh, Christianity as we know it and its predecessor Judaism is monotheistic. God, his prophets and his apostles never describe God as free or they. He is not the holy free. 
he's always the holy one so let's go into uh, Babylon very briefly so when I'm referring to Babylon just for context I'll be using it as a blanket term for the Sumerians and the Akkadians including Assyrians and Babylonians uh, these uh, people dominated Mesopotamia from the beginning of written history Mesopotamia is a historical region in West Asia situated within the Tigris Euphrates river system in modern days roughly corresponding to most of Iraq Kuwait parts of northern Saudi Arabia the eastern parts of Syria southeastern Turkey and the regions along the Turkish Syrian and Iraq borders so I want to read you a quote here now by Werner Keller from the Bible as history virtually all pagan practices had their beginnings in the city of Babylon during the time of Nimrod ancient traditions show that he rebelled against God and in doing so created a worldwide apostasy this is from Roderick C. Meredith from uh, Satan's Counterfeit Christianity. Later, the Roman Empire assimilated into its system the gods and religions of other countries over which it ruled. Since Babylon was the source of this paganism, we can easily see how Rome's early religion was a form of Babylonish worship that had developed under different forms and different names in the countries to which it had gone. Not only has the original Babylonian religious system served as the source of all the world's non-Christian religions but it has also infiltrated and corrupted Christendom to an alarming degree that final quote was there was uh, from Mish uh, Babylon mystery religion by Walf Woodrow so let me just go back to the word pantheon so pantheon means all the gods or people of a religion collectively so Babylon being the home of um all pagan religion it started with a pantheon of gods and this pantheon of these pantheon of gods i believe like i said before form satan's principality spirits the first and foremost of angels who fell with him from heaven and he in his order had these angels as his uh right hand men so to speak because as we know satan cannot be everywhere He's not omnipotent, he's not omniscient, so he has to delegate authority and they are second in command. So, ancient Mesopotamian religion was the first recorded. Mesopotamians believed that the world was a flat disc surrounded by a huge hold space and above that, heaven. They also believed that water was everywhere, the top, bottom, sides, and that the universe was born from this enormous sea in addition to... Mesop Mesopotamian religion was polytheistic so the pantheon of these gods that came out of Mesopotamia actually form all the pagan gods we see throughout the ages so Zeus and Horus and Osiris and the Hindu triads Xing Mu in China you know Ganesh all of these gods actually find their origin in the original original pantheon of gods that were created in Babylon and we see them passed down into Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Egyptian uh, uh, religious worship and all these kind of things. We have to understand this all started in Babylon and it can all be traced. Mesopotamia came to the fore after the flood and as we know if we are believers that this is where the origin of nations uh, begin and the dispensation of government starting in Genesis 10 and here we see Babel and Nimrod um, as its leader. Um, Babylon was the first of what we would now call urban centers or city-states. Until Babylon, most of the human world lived closely in tribal societies composed of several families or clans. Babylon also introduced the centralization of religion instead of a rich tapestry of many different tribal belief systems. All people absorbed into Babylon were indoctrinated into a single religious system this religion was built on a pyramid structure in which the priests held incredible social sway. The secrets of their religion, often termed mysteries, were reserved for only those priests at the top of the pyramid. All others in the priesthood were carefully chosen and inducted through a series of tests, mostly psychological in nature. So it is the home of modern civilization as we know it and the home of religion. And this is biblical. If you don't believe the Bible, then this is of no use to you. But if you believe the Bible, then you must believe that because this is 
clear and evident in the Bible um, from the Tower of Babel when God confused languages. So now I want to uh, read some passages to you from an interesting book I have called Babylonian and Assyrian Religion. And you're going to start to see now where I'm making the link between uh, the origin of pagan religion or the origin of every religion that is not a belief in Jesus Christ and his gospel and the divine feminine. First in this established order appears the high god Anu, whose name in Sumerian means heaven and who may be said to correspond to the Greek sky god Zeus. His sacred number was 60 and the heavenly equator was the special part of the heavens assigned to him. In the early period, Anu had a consort. A consort is like a, a partner or a wife. And the consort was a colourless entity without importance in the cult or mythology. But the, in the historical period, her place as the consort of Anu was filled by Inina or Ishtar, the great goddess, who under various names and diverse forms was the most important object of worship in the ancient Near East. It was believed that from the union of Anu and Antu, whose Sumerian names means the earth, were born the underworld gods called Anun Anunnaki and the seven evil Asaki or demons. Remember what I was saying about the original uh, pantheon of gods coming from Babylon and throughout the ages, their names changing and them being different um, uh, people or gods in the Greek mythology and Roman mythology and Egyptian religious worship. This is what I'm talking about. It's one spirit who throughout time has allowed itself to be called different names these different gods who make up the pantheon of gods who i say make up the principality spirits so it also says that a second member of the great babylonian triad of deities was enlil or elil whose name in sumerian means wind or storm god he was specially associated with the city of nippur and was like anu a sumerian god who was adopted by invading semites in the earlier period before Hammurabi, Enil seems to have taken precedence over the two other gods of the triad, but from the beginning of the second millennium onwards, his place is always the second. I'm going to fast forward now. It says, the third and most interesting of the first triad of great gods was Enki, or as he was generally called in later text, Ye, as Anu was the god of heaven, Enlil, the god of the uh, lands i.e of earth so enki came to be regarded as specially the god of the waters and was thought of as having his abode in aspu or abyss of waters the underworld ocean upon which according to babylonian cosmology the world rested a favorite designation of enki or ie was bel nimeki or lord of wisdom since he was regarded as the source of all secret magical knowledge and the instructor of mankind in all the arts crafts necessary for human well-being i'm going to fast forward again in the early list the figure of the mother goddess known under various names as nimak nintu nin saga and aruru was associated with the first great triad of gods her special function was concerned with childbirth as Aruru, she was associated with Enlil or Ie in the creation of mankind. Let me stop there. Two things. I told you that the triad or triunity of gods comes from Babylon. Does not come from Christianity. God never referred to himself as anything but one. Neither did anybody who spoke for God. So that's one thing. But the main thing about this is we see now here, he said in the early list, the figure of the mother goddess known under the various names. And I read the names out before. For pronunciation purposes, I'm not going to read them again. But any time we see anything to do with goddess in the Bible, it is pagan. Let us now go to the Bible uh, by way of Wikipedia. I do like Wikipedia sometimes because proves to you that the truth is out there if you really want it um, often truth is covered by lies and mixed with lies but as my father says satan always defeats himself and so and he always tells you what he's going to do before he's going to do it he also shows you truth and he shows you lies he mixes things but the truth is out there listen to what wikipedia says anyway 
Worship of a Queen of Heaven is recorded in the book of Jeremiah in the context of the prophet condemning such religious worship as blasphemy and a violation of the teachings of the God of Israel. In Jeremiah 7.18, the children gather wood, the fathers light the fire and the woman knead the dough and make cakes of bread for the Queen of Heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. In Jeremiah 45, 15 to 18, it says, Then all the men who knew that their wives were burning incense to other gods, along with all the women who were present, a large assembly, and all the people living in the lower and upper Egypt said to Jeremiah, We will not listen to the message you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. We will certainly do everything we said we would. We will burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her just as we and our fathers our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah in the streets of Jerusalem. At that time we had plenty of food and we were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and have been perishing by the sword and famine. There was a temple of Yahweh in Egypt at that time in the 6th and 7th centuries BC and that was central to the Jewish community at Elephantine in which Yahweh was worshipped in conjunction with the goddess Anath, also named in the temple papyri as Anath Befo and Anath Ayal. The goddess Asherah, Anath and Astarte first appear as distinct and separate deities in the tablets discovered in the ruins of the library of Ugarit, modern Ras Shamra Syria. Some biblical scholars tend to regard these goddesses as one, especially as the title the Queen of Heaven. And as I mentioned before, this is from the pantheon of Babylon, Ishtar, Astarte, Samarimus, all one spirit, different names. Also, it's interesting, it says that uh, these uh, gods were worshipped in conjunction with Yahweh. We are now seeing, and we have seen before, because we have Santeria, which is a mixture of voodoo and worship of saints and Christianity. But we're now seeing another re-emergence of merging Christianity with paganism and it's coming via the way of the divine feminine this is a manifestation or one of the manifestations of the divine feminine God is masculine God presents himself as masculine when he comes to earth he comes in the form of a man anytime we see anything to do with worship of female deity we are clearly and distinctly um associating or dealing with paganism thus dealing with satanic worship i cannot be more emphatic on this you cannot call yourself a believer and believe in the divine feminine anything there's no angelic beings referred to as female now the bible does also say that in god there is neither male nor female and we know that when we get to heaven we will not have a gender but on earth, there are gender and gender has roles. And there is also in the spirit realm, we have never been introduced to the feminine. It's only masculine. And so you need to deal with that information how you would like. It's not me uh, making men better than women. But this is how God has presented himself and his angels. Any thing to do with worship of feminine or deity that is feminine is pagan point blank period now hear this now next in order in the early god list comes a second triad of divinities with an associated female deity this triad was composed of sin the moon god shamash the sun god and adad or hadad the storm god while the associated female figure was that of the goddess ishtar Sin is thought to be of nomadic origin and in early Arabian cult, the moon is masculine. Now, the moon god is actually Allah, but we'll get into that another time. While the sun is feminine. Although, since the name Sin is Semitic, the invading Semites may have brought the cult of the moon god with them. Nevertheless, he is found in the early Sumerian list under the name Nana. The female divinity associated with the second triad is the best known and most widely worshipped goddess in the whole Babylonian and Assyrian pantheon, the goddess Ishtar. The usual form of her name in Sumerian is Inina, although she is already stated associated with the second triad 
of gods. Yet at an early date, she ousted Anu's legitimate consort, the colourless figure Antu, from her place and became herself the consort of the high god Anu. She gradually came to absorb into herself the attributes of most of the other female divinities and was known as the goddess par excellence. She figures largely in Babylonian mythology, especially in the flood stories and the epic of Gilgamesh, of which we shall have more to say later. Ishtar presents two very distinct aspects. On the one hand, she is the goddess of love and procreation, and those sacred persons known as Herodules or temple prostitutes were attached to her temples. On the other hand, she was also the goddess of war, especially in Assyria, and is figured on seals as armed with a bow and quiver. She is even represented as bearded like the god Ashur. I want to stop there for a second and deal with Ishtar uh, being associated with temple prostitution. One of the manifestations of the divine feminine through feminism and uh, through the free love movement, which kicked off in the 60s, was the uh, foring of the moral temperature. It was a time when it was a shame to have a child out of wedlock. Even in my lifetime, if you was known as a female who'd slept with many guys, you'd be discredited. It wasn't a good thing. Now it's okay. Now we actually have stuff like the Ambrose Slut Walk where people are campaigning to make the word slut okay because women should be able to sleep with who they want, when they want. Now, I'm not attacking women because promiscuity amongst men is no good either. But it used to be a shame to be known as a girl who sleeps around. Now it's okay. Now we have the whole Instagram model thing. We have Kim Kardashian releasing a sex tape and you know getting a tv show but that was actually done uh to promote her tv show but she learnt that from paris hilton that was the test that was satan's testing the moral temperature of the world and see what they would accept so in accepting what paris hilton did before her tv show was launched he knew he could do it through kim kardashian and so now we have we get to a situation where uh being immodest is okay being um Acting and dressing like a prostitute is okay. I remember when I was younger and we would go through central London late and we'd be able to, I'd be able to spot a prostitute by the, you know, the clothes she wore. Now you come to church and those are the very same clothes some of us are wearing to church. This is the time that we live in and this is one of the manifestations of the divine feminine that is especially coming out of the feminism movement. It's this whole idea that the woman is goddess and she is in control over herself and she can do what she wants. That whole do as thou wilt is satanic for men and for women. Because if we submit ourselves to God, actually that is a submitting of our mission. We do not have control of our bodies. The Bible tells us that do you not know your body is the temple of the living God? That a price was paid for our bodies, a price was paid for us to be redeemed we know our physical bodies can't be redeemed but a price was paid for our entrance or for our ability to enter heaven and so if the if our body is the temple of the living god we cannot treat it anyway but now we have this divine feminine uh manifestation coming through feminism where women can do what they want with their bodies and it's promoting especially to women that you can do what you want with your bodies and then we have those religious movements that are saying even the black woman is god which is garbage the black woman ain't god the white woman ain't god the indian woman ain't god no woman is god and so these movements are giving us this notion of free will do as you want that is satanic and antichrist it is a lie because in saying do what you want you are actually doing exactly what satan did so in satan selling you freedom he's selling you freedom from god's dominion over you free domain free rule you are saying to god you cannot have any dominion over me because i am free to do what i want but actually freedom is found in christ because when you submit yourself to christ you are no longer subject to the things of this world you're no subject to the pressures of this world the expectations of men 
but Satan is tricking people, men and women, into believing that freedom is freedom from God's rule over them, which is why he was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to do his own thing. Also, so let us deal now with the divine feminine. In the definition, it says a spiritual, psychological and archetypal ideal of feminine energy, the highest, most inspiring and truest expression of femininity, universal and inherent energy, counterpart to the divine masculine within all mankind that manifests through an individual's thoughts, actions and beliefs. So let's deal with the counterpart to the divine masculine. Now, we read already that in the early list, the figure of the mother goddess known under various names such as Ninmash, Nintu and Nishiraga and Aruru was associated with the first great triad of gods. So we see now in the beginnings of the creations of pagan religion, the consort and the association of the divine feminine is in the very beginning. This, my friends, is deep paganism. This is satanic. The consort the counterpart to the divine masculine is the divine feminine. Now, anytime we are dealing with a counterpart to a divine masculine, we're dealing with paganism. And this is where we see the holy mother of God, Mary, worshipped as the queen of heaven in Catholicism. Anytime you're dealing with worship of female deity, it's paganism. I can't stress that enough. So the first triad of gods had their, their, their consort or their mother goddess, their counterpart of the divine feminine. But in the second triad is where we get Ishtar. Her symbol was an eight or 16 pointed star. She is generally represented as riding on or accompanied by her sacred beast, the lion. Now I've been talking about the media and certain musical artists pushing agendas. You've seen Beyonce with a lion. That is not a coincidence. Now, if you can believe that's a coincidence, fine, okay. But now you see her representing Ishtar with the star on her head, just like the Statue of Liberty is Ishtar. And you're seeing these pictures, these represent representations of Ishtar. This is not a coincidence, people. This is the manifestation of the divine feminine. This is the counterpart to the so-called divine masculine. You see, what you all need to understand is Satan is remixing his whole doctrine and ideology like Diddy in the 90s. This is like the bad boy remix. He's coming at us with so many different angles now. And as I keep saying, he is going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. For those Christians who are not rooted and grounded, they will be picked off ever so easily. And if you think I'm making this up or you think I'm hyping, let's go to this website and read what it says. It says this, the divine feminine is experiencing a re-emergence, a rebirth into the collective consciousness. For centuries, she has been downplayed, demeaned, removed from her place of honour and reverence by the dominant patriarchal culture. We are now in a time when the divine feminine is the subject of intense interest and many conversations and she's be beginning to receive the veneration and devotion she deserves. The Divine Feminine represents the supreme level of feminine expression and manifestation in the universe. She comprises the best of the feminine in all its measure. Women subjugated to male thinking and ideals can lack examples and models to nurture their inherent connection to the divine. By considering the stellar qualities of positive divine archetypes, women will find models of thinking and behaviour that nurtures spiritual and psychological advancement. We look at another website it says here make no mistake the divine feminine is in no way a woman only concept we all have masculine and feminine energy within us in yoga these energies are known as shiva and shakti yin and yang 
Ida and Pingala. The left side of the body relates to the feminine, the right side relates to the masculine. Honouring and connecting to the divine feminine is an act of worship, not only to oneself but also to the divine mother, the essence of all creation and the god of your own distinct understanding of the universe. It is sacred connection to the mother earth and to the very energy of giving birth to ideas, expressions, dreams, life and existence. The divine feminine is part of us all. And it goes on to say here are seven examples of how to or practice how to draw yourself closer to this inherent energy. We're not going to go into that. We don't want anybody to dabble or experiment who's already weak. But the point of what I've been saying is this. These music artists, these celebrities, these personalities are funneling and remixing ancient satanic demonic forces and feeding them to you and you as the christian cannot afford not to be sober and vigilant because you are allowing and opening yourself up for demons if you allow these things into your house and into your life there's reasons why some of you are having the dreams you're having there's reasons why you're being held down in your dream why you can't say nothing it's not sleep paralysis it's not this stupid scientific explanation. These are spirit beings holding you down because you've allowed these things to enter into your consciousness, into your psyche, into your house because of the music you're listening to, some of the TV shows you're watching. You as a Christian need to know through your relationship with God what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. You are what you eat. You cannot, you cannot consume everything. We are peculiar people. We are a royal nation, a holy priesthood. We are put here on earth to show forth the praises of God. We are supposed to be an example to the nations. We cannot be involved in everything. We cannot take part in everything. Royalty does not do everything. It does not go. They do not go everywhere. It's time in this season that we understand what we are seeing. The One of the um, strategies of the Illuminati is symbolism. The symbolism is everywhere and it's not coincidental. These symbols have existed since ancient Babylon, the home of all religion. That star of David, you can find that in Babylon. The sun god, that moon disc, that wafer that the Catholic Church uses, the worship of the sun god that they do through their practices, all in Babylon. It is time to wake up and it's time to realise what is being fed to us through the media. We have to be sober and vigilant. On part two, I'm going to deal expressly with the divine feminine's um, influence through f uh, feminism. And how that started in the 60s and how that has uh, made itself now into our consciousness. Um, it is not anything to do with equal rights. That is a nice uh, cover for a more satanic purpose. It's not that we don't believe that women should be paid the same as men. Not at all. Women shouldn't be harassed and raped any or anything like that. But Satan is smart. He's never going to just appear and say worship me. He has a way of mixing the truth and the lie. He did it in the garden with Eve. This is why Christians, you need to know your Bible. If you don't know your Bible, you do not know the subtleties of Satan. You don't know how much of a trickster he is. It's time for us to wake up. Uh, if you've made it to the end of this teaching, well done. In part two, like I said, I want to deal more with feminism. We're going to see how the Divine Feminine is manifesting uh, in more detail through feminism. So I hope that you will continue to watch this series. Stay close to Christ.